uh, Sig and, uh, and with the committee, the Climate and Health Committee. So there are three objectives in our uh, strategy. And the first one is to support the workforce uh, in knowledge, skills and capability in the climate emergency. Uh, and also to access resources with uh, confidence to make the case for the health code benefits of action and climate change. And that's the key one for today. The other two are on advocacy and demonstrating leadership uh, by being a net zero organization. And we're making progress on both those other two. But the top one is about supporting you, the workforce. When we reviewed the strategy earlier this year, this came out as one of the most important areas and people wanted to have some real examples and, um, uh, and, and real uh, evidence for competences and change. So this workshop came about as a result of that. And we've got some objectives, uh, which is um, uh, to uh, increase the understanding in this area and how competences during training um, can be supported and also in a variety of placements uh, and contexts, and also to make sure we've got some consistency across um, the UK and regions. So um, without further ado, I'm really pleased to now hand over to David uh, Chappell, who's our academic registrar, and then um, we'll go through the rest of the agenda after that. But David, over to you, please. Thanks. Um, thanks, Paul. I'm David Chappell, the academic registrar. So as Paul says, I oversee education and training activists of the faculty. Um, uh, I'm based in the Northeast. Um, so uh, I didn't want to say very much, but just a couple of sort of comments. I mean, this is obviously clearly a really important area for not just trainees, but for, for, for consultants to develop their skills and knowledge. Um, the, the, although the curriculum has only one specific competency around this, it, the reality of the curriculum is it's they're high level competencies, which can be um, gained in a, in a variety of, of, of areas and topics and, and places. And really what I'm hoping to, to see today is that you can be working on climate and health and developing a, you know, a huge range of competencies that you'll be using um, uh, not just in, in climate and health issues, but in, in other areas. And uh, one of the challenges to make sure people have the opportunities uh, in any region, there's always lots going on. Um, you know, there's work around <clears throat> whether it's greening the NHS or or, or more in a, a broader uh, area outside of, of health. And so there, there should be plenty of opportunities um, for for trainees to to get involved in projects and um, and to, to develop their um skills in this area. One of the other comments I wanted to make was that um, when you ask educational supervisors and other trainers why they do it, one of the commonest responses is because they learn so much from their trainees. And I think this is a sort of an important kind of an example where actually if you're supervising someone and, and get them involved in a project with someone with a bit of expertise in climate and health issues, you know, they will bring back that learning to you because you'll you'll uh, reflect with them on it and and I think that's always been the way of training that actually um, you know trainers and training organizations often uh, do better because they're actually bringing in that knowledge from from the next generation who are learning it um, uh, directly um, with with people with expertise so so I think that's really important uh, uh, flow of, of 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 knowledge and skills um, but at the same time you know all of us who are um, uh, a consultant level need to be doing our CPD to make sure we're we're we, we're getting what we can from uh, all the the new knowledge that's developing at the moment. So, so really important area. So, um, um, uh, <clears throat> I'll I'll um, hand over to uh, Emma to kind of talk about um, uh, a bit more about today's session and and what we're going to get out of it. Great, thanks, David, and uh, really really helpful. Thank you. I'm going to, without further ado, hand over to Ema Ema O'Connell, who is uh, leading uh, us. Uh, in this area and um, she's going to take us through a short presentation I think Ema and then we're going to go yep. into six case studies um, and then Kat at the end will uh, coordinate uh, a conversation Q&A's and discussion and considering what next step so uh, without further ado Ema can I hand over to you please. Great thanks very much and um, thanks for having me. Um, I'm a consultant in public health working in the DLA public health unit at the moment and I guess Kat asked me because I've worked in environment and health for a really long time 
Um, my primary degree was in zoology, so that interface between ecologies and human health has always been the reason why I ended up in public health. So, and more recently, um, I've been working um, on roles that are very focused on climate change. So I've had the advantage of, um, you know, having that topic expertise. Um, and I guess one of the challenges that um, registrars are saying to me is that um, they find that they're really um, very concerned about the role that climate will play in their future careers as well as their personal lives. And they really want to know more about it. But there's also tension there that they feel that they can't get that experience or they feel that they don't have the depth of knowledge um, that they need. And the number one message that I would give to you, the key message really is that you already have those skills. Your public health trainee equips you with skills that are not only entirely relevant, but also really lacking in a lot of the climate conversations. So I guess this is a call to arms to you to say, like, have the confidence um, to do climate work. And there are opportunities out there. It's not always too easy when you're in your public health training to, you know, do something unusual. But um, the case can be made and there is support there as evidenced by the fact that this is hosted by Paul and David and the faculty themselves. So um, and there are lots of you here, which is really amazing. Working climate felt like a very lonely place for a really long time. So I'm really happy that everyone's um, involved in it now. Um, I've got a few slides. I'll rattle through them. Um, I know lots of you already know some of this, but um, making the case has been, um, I've been told that it's quite hard sometimes to make the case um, to, for doing this work when resources are con so constrained um, and registrar time is so valuable. Is that just sharing loads of random stuff for you guys? Um, or is it actually doing the slides? I don't find Zoom that easy to use. No, it is, Emma. Okay, cool. Okay, so I think another key message is really that the amount of climate change that's already embedded in is inevitable. There's a cert There are some uncertainties in terms of climate and health, but actually change is certain. The amount of climate um, warming that's already locked in is considerable. Um, it's just a matter of how much um, that depends on our ambition and our ability to mitigate um, emissions from here. I think really like this infographic. This is where we are now. So even if we move into the most ambitious mitigation scenarios where somebody, so this is me, I'm probably a bit older than that, if I'm honest, but by the time I'm 70, it's going to be considerably warmer. So whatever your role is in public health or in healthcare or in society, you're going to have to deal with climate change, both as a transformation of society to decarbonisation or transformation when we need to adapt to the extent of warming that's already locked in. Um, the health impacts are really well characterized here. Um, a lot of the focus at the moment is on extreme events. And I think that's probably just um, because those are the ones that we're beginning to see for ourselves, um, certainly in this country. But I think that probably one that we're not paying enough attention to is infection. Um, we know that uh, small climactic shifts historically been associated with the emergence or re-emergence of really significant um, population um, outbreaks, so cholera and, the, um, and um, smallpox are really good examples. So I think probably this one is one I'm more worried about now because everybody seems to be paying a lot of attention to extreme events, at least there's some activity in that, but the the impacts are going to be very diverse, not just on health outcomes, but also on health systems. So this goes back to what I was saying earlier. This is regardless of what part of public health you work in, whether it's healthcare, prevention, whatever, it's going to affect the populations you serve or the way you serve your populations to the health systems. It will erode the resilience of our communities and our health system. It'll affect the social and structural determinants of health and the ecological determinants of health. So we're caught, we're talking about a massive, massive system-wide change. And um, even if you're not that particularly interested in climate, you will have to start to take account of it, account of it in your decision making and your your population vulnerabilities. There's also really well characterized risks for us domestically. Um, these are unmanaged risks, and that is very, very categorical in the UK climate risk assessment. The list is here. You can see it's the obvious ones, high temperature, flooding, sea level rise, buildings, energy, power outages. We're going to have to um, consider how to um, think about them in, in our lives as we go forward as well. Air quality, vector borne disease, food safety and food security, as well as other things like migration, which are much more difficult to characterize. But the evidence here is very good. You know, the, um, the climate change risk assessment provides us with a really, really good evidence base of where we are now in terms of um, health, but also the wider system. So if you're going to start from somewhere, you could start with the climate change risk assessment. It's a really good baselining. Um, 
but there's also huge opportunities with the changes that are coming and we need to be at the table for for those decisions and for those investment decisions so um a good example of um a highly engaged public health department would be merton they've just published their public health report which is identifying the health care benefits of climate action locally and using the place making um infrastructure that we have now to mobilize that and as dagmar would say herself we're really not sweating this enough everybody's keen that we do um uh, capitalize on the health care benefits but there's little evidence of that happening in reality um, there's also going to be huge investment, private and public investment, um, to tackle climate change mitigation as well as adaptation. And we also need to be aware of where that money is going to be spent to make sure that we get the best social value from it, um, particularly in terms of health inequalities. Um, also, in terms of research, there's huge mobilization of research funding around this. There's a Centre of Climate Change just announced from the UK ORI 9.7 million. Welcome. It's one of their three strategic priorities for the next 10 years. The Rockefeller Foundation, it's like everybody is focusing on climate and health. And uh, there's not so much of a presence of, of public health people there. And you can really see it in the way the risks are being characterized and in the way that the research is, is being shaped. And I really think that that's a gap there, both in terms of the quality of the evidence that comes out of it, but also in terms of um, the opportunity that's missed um, in taking advantage of that funding. Um, the other reason why we should be at the table is there are really significant equity issues here. Um, it's not just globally, but also domestically. Those who emit the most are the ones who are going to be, um, those who emit the least are going to be the ones who are most affected by the impacts of climate change due to their, their lower levels of resilience, um, lack of insurance, for example, but also their baseline health. Um, and the Carbon Brief has, have done some really good infographics on this. I'll share my slides afterwards so you can use these yourselves if you want to make um, use of them afterwards. So the Association for Schools of Public Health in Europe region have done a really, really nice piece of work looking at the competencies for public health professionals. And I'm not going to read through them, but I suggest if you're interested in doing climate work that you do have a read through, through them because if when you read through them, it becomes completely apparent that most of us have the core skills you need to do this. You really do. They're like knowledge and analytical skills, communication and advocacy, collaboration and partnerships, policy. This is public health bread and butter. The bit of topic expertise, obviously you need to build that, but you can get that from reading through the climate change risk assessment and the Lancet articles. Your base, you have core competencies there that are really needed for the climate um, challenge and that are lacking at the moment. And you know, your baseline is really excellent. Those technical skills and those partnership working skills are what's needed for this. And um, the other reason why um, I think it's really important that public health people get, are engaged in this is we are uniquely well placed across the system. We have a perspective that other people don't. We can see population elements that, you know, a lot of the climate work is really siloed. You have your energy people, you have your waste people, you have people who work on planning, but there's very few people who take that sort of system wide perspective and can see how the different parts of the systems interact. And few professions are as spread across the different parts of the systems but still have a coherent core like public health professionals do we are really really well placed to help influence the outcomes here and i think it's really important that we take advantage of that and see ourselves as like a highly valued part of the system um, with a really important role to play so how can you do it um, well in terms of capacity building there are some climate focused um, placements. There's the UK HSA Climate and Health Security Centre, extreme events, for example, but they do have really limited number of places there. The Met Office have are accredited at a placement. They are down in Exeter, which might be difficult, but I, they're really desperate for registrars to come and work with them. So they probably would be flexible on remote working. Uh, the Green NHS has fellowships. I think they're getting themselves established as a training location as well. Um, but there are other placements with climate and health projects um, attached to them, like the GLA, for example, very strong climate function there. Um, local government, lots of people have done placements. You're going to hear about some of them later today. Um, Anya's at the FCDO at the moment doing a climate um, and health focused placement. But there are other parts of the system where I think that a public health person or a registrar would really make a huge difference and where they'd be doing very, very health relevant um, projects with a really significant opportunity to influence health outcomes. For example, the Committee for Climate Change, 
um, Department for Energy Security and Net Zero, they have a huge budget, really like massive budget. We should be influencing that budget and making sure that health equity is embedded within the policies that they're designing. Because I've worked with them, not not when they were with Bayes before, and they 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 don't have that way of thinking. And it's really it really is a massive gap. DEFRA are the leads for adaptation. They would love to have some health input there. The Environment Agency as well, and the UK Health Alliance for Climate Change. There are lots of other um, voluntary sector organisations where you could work, um, and you can do really good climate, effective climate change work. So. Um, I'll leave it there and um, I guess you get to hear about the experience of people who've done climate and change work but um, I would also offer if anybody needs help in putting together like uh, making the case for a climate placement I'm always available to help do that um, and I'm really keen to support registrars or consultants who need work getting up to like getting started or um, trying to facilitate building relationships with key partners as well if I can. Great okay. thanks very much Emma. that's Great presentation, lots of really good challenges there as well. I wonder whether um, uh, Emu will be able to, or someone could put the link to the Merton um, uh, DPH, annual DPH report. I thought that, that looked yeah, like we'll a really good uh, piece of uh, vital information for us. And um, also perhaps we can share your slides, particularly the ASFAR uh, competences as well. I think that was um, really well made. I know there's quite yeah. a lot of conversations going on at the moment with uh, with us first. So excellent. Thank you very much, Emma. Um, without further ado, then let's move on to uh, the case studies. And I'm going to uh, start with uh, Mark, Mark Davis. I think you're there, aren't you, Mark? Yeah, Mark's uh, a consultant. But can I get you to introduce yourself and um, also perhaps the work you did as on a placement with the faculties committee as well, if you'd like to introduce that, Mark. Yeah. So hopefully that will be covered. Just to check, can you hear me? This is my first Zoom call of the day, so without checking, can you hear me? Is that all good? Real perfect. Um, so yeah, so I'm uh, Mark Davis. I'm yeah, as um, Paul said, I'm currently a consultant in public health down in Swansea Bay University Health Board. Um, at the time of doing this, I was a registrar on the Wales Training Scheme, um, and what I'll just talk through is, I suppose, just to give an example, I suppose, on how specific projects could be slotted within a broader training program um because i think it's fair to say trying to um undertake i suppose the breadth of placements or breadth of opportunities within the constraints of training and requirements be it he gmc and the like um i thought i'd just give a bit of a flavor of, of how i managed to make that work in the context of this because um as you can imagine it, well i think we've all got experience of actually some of the governance of the paperwork side can slow some of this down and actually prevent us from making the most of some of these um ad hoc opportunities and hopefully this will just give a bit of a flavor of that um so um a project i was going to talk a bit more about in the context of this broader climate and health work i did at the final part of my training um it was advertised with a faculty and um, so if built us through down to the TPDs, the different regions. Um, so I think there's been a few examples now where the faculty have advertised projects. And I emphasize projects here because in the context of the GMC and um, the education bodies, project carried a lot of weight compared to placements, which I'll explain later on. Um, but essentially this was advertised towards the end of 2020 with expressions of interest submitted in January with a start date of February. And um, so again, just to emphasize there, quite a tight turnaround. Um, so again, calling it a project really helped actually be able to respond to that and join a project quite quickly on in, in that process. Um, one of the main tasks within that was to support the newly established Climate and Health Committee in developing a new strategy. And um, so that was developed during the time that I was there. And the role of the registrar and the role that I took on during that then was supporting the development of that strategy. Um, there's a bit more detail there in terms of what was in that project description itself. Again, more than happy to share that with anyone who wants to find more details about what that might look like, how we was advertised. Um, but as you can see, and I think it's what Ian was already referred to, you know, working on climate and health, there was opportunities to meet learning outcomes across a range of areas. These are just some of the examples, but I think in reality, there's probably a lot more that could have been covered. Thinking about the context of where I was in my training, I'd just done my K10 panel. Um, off the back of that, um, and off the back of my learning from COVID, actually, um, I was quite keen to take on something that um, was, I think, I suppose, thinking about some of the big hazards in public health. So COVID and pandemics made me think about climate and nature emergency as well. So I was quite keen to think about that in my final year of training. 
Um, so I was quite keen to build a few different projects and placements for that final year of training, which um, integrated and applied uh, consultant practice competencies in the area of climate and health. And then this project um, came out at the perfect time, really, for me to be able to build that into my final year of training. Um, so just to give a bit of an overview, um, and this is how I made it work, such that I didn't have to apply throughout the programme, so I could keep it within my existing placement and do this faculty work within my existing training. So my educational supervisor stayed the same through my training, so I still classed as a home trainee. Um, for the duration of my training, then I still had placement supervisors who were home based. Yeah. So I was doing climate and health work locally within the whole of our public health team in West Wales. And then the other part of the week, then I was doing some national work across government. So with the chief environmental public health officer, what I did within that was building this faculty project. So I had placement supervision that was home supervision for the whole week. And then I had project supervision from Maggie Ray and Sue Atkinson to develop the climate and health strategy. The reason I'm drawing that distinction was there was a bit of confusion at the beginning, I suppose, as to whether it was a project or a placement. And I think for us, we have HEIW. Some of the questions were being asked, well, if it's right, a placement, then you'd have to go and apply for a programme and go through all that process. So by calling it a project and having placement supervision that was home-based for the duration, meant that I could basically start this project within a couple of months of it being advertised. So I think that was critical to, to being able to do this as part of my final year of training. Again, because I was in my final year of training, um, the focus was on K10, and these were some of the main outcomes I was looking to achieve. Again, as Ian has referred to, this was a really good topic area um, to really try to apply all the breadth of public health skills um, in preparation for consultant practice. So those are just some of the key ones that I'd identified for my personal needs. So again, some of the key objectives, and this is just lifted from my activity summary sheet actually. So um, just a few pertinent points, just to think, well, actually, what did I get out of it specifically as an, as an attachment? And um, so, as I said, the main thing was to develop my competencies for consultant practice. And um, one of the other key objectives was developing my experience of system leadership and strategy development, um, as well as collaborative leadership across organizational boundaries. So that's where the work with the faculty, along with the work with Welsh government and the local public health team really helped to hone that in. Um, and again, where opportunities allowed to gain experience of working in multi-sector environments at national and international levels. Yeah. Lots of examples of what came out of it. So here's just a flavor, I suppose, of, of what that particular project in the faculty helped me get some more um, experience of. So as I said, the main piece of work was contributing to the committee and developing the strategy. And um, the timing was, was really good as well because it was the year of COP26. So as part of that, there was lots of opportunities to work extensively across national and international organizations to ask to contribute to conversations held by WHO, Global Climate and Health Alliance, and UK Hack in the build up to COP26. And in that, then, you know, there were plenty of opportunities to take on leadership roles in providing advice and guidance and expertise on the role of public health within that. And then again, because it sat within that broader scheme of placements that were back in my um, home deanery, there was an opportunity then to link back with work that was already running in parallel, both in Welsh Government. So as I said, I was supervised by the Chief Environmental Public Health Officer for Wales, and then linking it back to some of the local work and the developing strategy and planning around claims and health within local public health teams. And um, so this was in West Wales in particular. So for me, that really helped to hone in how this cross-cutting theme and issue can be um, used to enhance working across local, national and international levels. I appreciate that's very short and sweet, but I've left my contact details at the front and I'm happy to share the slides around at the end. So if anyone's got any particular questions, I'm more than happy to pick them up by email as well. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. Thanks very much, Mark. And I can I can uh, definitely uh, vouch that some of the work you've done, particularly at national level, working with the government of Wales has been um, really, really uh, groundbreaking and um, very, very helpful. Um, I'm just aware of time. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to ask people to do straightforward presentations and then we'll do a con discussion questions at the end. So if you can either pop your questions in the chat or hold them until um, that last session, that would be really helpful. So thanks, Mark. I'm going to move on now to Anya. Uh, Anya Gopfer, I think many of you know as a uh, public health registrar in the Southwest, and she's also chair of the SDC. Anya, over to you. Hello, um, can you hear me? Yeah. Hi, sorry, I'm just needing to do some slightly complicated logistics due to not being able to get on Zoom from my work laptop. Um, let me just see if I can share my slides. 
and you can see them. Is that working? Yeah, we can see those. Thanks, Sonia. Um, so, uh, hi everyone, uh, uh, Paul's already introduced me, so I won't, go, I won't go back into that. I just wanted to give a little bit of an overview about um, the work that I've done related to climate and health um, throughout my training. And I've just picked a couple of um, examples that are that I set up slightly differently from each other to, to kind of highlight a few different ways in which um, both registrars might be able to advocate for this to be within their training or supervisors might be able to support trainees um to to uh, contribute to the climate and health agenda within their training so um i've um these are the three examples that I've, I've chosen to talk about so i first want to highlight um some work that i did whilst i was on my local authority placement so i'm a trainee in the southwest and um, my local authority placement was at tall bay um local authority so hi if there's anybody here from there um what i kind of um, noticed when I started working at the local authority was that um, there wasn't much going on in the public health team with regards to climate change or environmental sustainability and this was already an area that I was very interested in so I um, decided to discuss with my supervisor, my education supervisor, who was one of the consultants in the team, um, whether I could undertake a piece of basically kind of scoping work or an initial start on a strategy but the way that I wanted to do that was um, to gather as much information as possible from the team with regards to what maybe had been done before or what was ongoing that um, maybe hadn't been collated in one space and also then use kind of the conversations with the team to come up with an initial idea for how the team could start to both um, embed climate change into their work uh, as a priority but also embed sustainable sustainability elements into their existing work so the way that I did that in the end was um, I undertook interviews with each member of the public health team and I started with the more junior members of the team so the project kind of team assistants and um, the uh, practitioners the kind of more junior practitioners uh, and I had a kind of pro forma questions that I asked everybody but I used the each individual conversation to kind of come up with a slightly adapted pro forma as I moved um, through the team and what I was aiming to do with this process was first of all get a sense from the team about whether this was an area that they were interested in working on which it definitely was and that's what I found out but also whether this was an area that um, they had ideas about how their job could incorporate climate change and sustainability considerations into their work. And, and my last interview was with the director of public health and what I did in that one was I played back to him uh, what I'd heard from others as well and also did some work with him about kind of which things he felt would be feasible for us to incorporate into our um, existing work which might be kind of more slightly medium term objectives to the team to work towards and what might not be feasible within the current kind of political and financial constraints and a few pieces of learning that that I took from this project so firstly I was really amazed how many amazing ideas came out of the team. And I actually felt that the kind of 45 minute interviews that I did, it often took a bit of warming up for people to realize that they had ideas. And I think that's probably because people are so busy, and this was also during COVID, that they were so busy doing all of the COVID stuff that even that space and time to kind of think and come up with, well, what might I do if I was given the opportunity was, was a little bit difficult for people to move into. But when they did, the ideas just were flowing and there were so many and they were small and big and in between and um, you know internal facing and external facing. And I just thought that was absolutely fantastic. And, and actually what people really enjoyed it and people really wanted to work on this topic, it was very important to them. And I get, kept getting follow up emails from the team afterwards saying, oh, by the way, I've thought of something else, please can you add this into your report and so on. The second piece of learning that um, I took from this was um, the way that I approached it was that my final interview with the director of public health I then kind of worked with the team um, took it to the team meeting and um, to kind of present what our next steps might be for example but I'd already um, discussed them with the DPH so there wasn't going to be kind of disagreement amongst the team about what necessarily was going to be realistically um, implementable immediately so I think it was important to get that senior buy-in to the to the action plan and the next steps to make sure that it, it was um, agreed by everybody. And I think the third, the third piece of learning here was just that this needs, like this was my kind of way of trying to do this in a way that involved the whole team because this really needs to be the whole team. It can't just be one person driving it forwards. However, and um, obviously I was a registrar and at some point I moved on and I don't know how 
how this carried on afterwards and whether it really did make a difference or not. So it felt like it was something really positive at the start. Um, and I really hope that they use the report that I wrote up of the of the work afterwards. But there's always an element of risk, I guess, um, in terms of sustainability. So I just wanted to kind of flag that here and, and kind of say for any particularly any supervisors listening, that it's really good if you've got an action plan for how those things can be carried over once a registrar maybe moves on. Briefly, I just wanted to touch on, because I know Ema mentioned the Environment Agency in her presentation at the beginning. She said kind of why not? So I have done a project to get use the correct terminology with the Environment Agency as part of my kind of officially on placement at the local authority. But I went for two days a week to work with the Environment Agency in Devon. This actually came about because the Environment Agency, believe it or not, have a national public health team. And the head of that public health team had established that registrars, public health registrars were um, potentially somebody that he might be able to work with. And so he had actually approached the training programme and um, asked if they could they could set up a project and they'd kind of worked with the training programme to design the project and then invited us to, to apply to, to participate in it. I think this was an amazing opportunity and I would really, really advocate for others to consider it. Uh, one of the reasons I think this is such an amazing opportunity is that the Environment Agency has offices in every single region in the country. So registrars in any regional training program could hypothetically do a project with the Environment Agency um, rather than it needing to be a nationally approved um, training placement. And also the Environment Agency are very keen on this. So capacity wise, there, there's a lot of interest from their kind of local teams to take people on. So I would really um, advocate for people to do this. The second thing is I did my work because I was on placement at the local authority in Torbay, I did my environment agency work with the with Torbay as my focus. So I made sure that the work that I did while I was there was about linking up um, the environment agency's work with my local authority work and, and region to, to kind of give the mutual benefit, ben, ben, benefit to both um, organisations. Um, and, and finally, I did a bit of work at the end of my place project with them um, where I wrote kind of guidance for how I thought they should set up projects in the future and one idea I had as well was that it could be set up as a partnership project with a regional UK HSA body now the reason that I talked that the reason I suggested this was that I felt that there a lot of the work that I was doing was actually probably also beneficial to UK HSA in terms of health protection and thinking about health protection and um, environmental determinants of health but I didn't have a direct link, to, link into UK HSA, but I found that I was wanting a little bit of their input and guidance into the work that I was doing. So I met with the um, Environment Agency's uh, public health head and the head of the um, UK HSA Southwest team before I left. And we had a bit of a conversation about how we could um, uh, set those up as joint placements, at least that the UK HSA would be providing some sort of contact point for a uh, registrar on placement um, at the Environment Agency to contact them. And then finally, I, I don't want to talk too long, so just very briefly I want to mention I'm on placement at the moment at FCDO, uh, and I know that um, Ema put this onto her slide as well um, at the beginning. What, what happened here, and I think the kind of upper level learning even, is that I um, advocated for my placement to be to allow me to work on climate and health within the placement. So it wasn't, it isn't, and will not be set up as a climate and health placement. Um, and it is obviously a global health placement, but obviously climate and health is becoming increasingly a global health priority. And literally in the last two weeks, it's, I think it's jumped about five levels up in, in terms of prioritization globally. So it will increasingly be part of any placement at FCDO, but I worked quite hard um, with the educational supervisor at FCDO to to lobby for me to be able to work on climate and health and kind of make the case for why that was a good use of their resources um, because I was coming to them as kind of an extra pair of hands. So I, I'm gonna stop there because I don't know how long I've got, but basically that I just wanted to give uh, that overview of, of a few things and I'm happy to kind of talk to any of them in more detail or, or answer any questions. Yeah, thanks Anya. Really uh, three areas of excellent areas of, uh, of overview on what we can do on placement. So without further ado, I'm gonna ask, um, uh, Miho uh, Yashizaki to uh, present her uh, presentation and um, and then we're going to uh, if I can ask you to be just five minutes please because I'm really very keen that we have a proper conversation at the end drawing in uh, on all the uh, the learning from this so over to you thank you thank 
Thank you, thank you. Um, I don't know if you can share my screen now. I tried to share yeah, my screen. Yeah, we can yeah. see it fine. Yeah, we can you. see, but it's not in presenting mode. Can you please put uh, it in presenting yeah. mode? Yeah, thank you, yeah. Michal. That's great. Perfect. Okay, thank you. So I'm going to just quickly talk about the project that I'm working on at the moment in my placement in Haringey Council, um, which is one of the boroughs in London. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Miho Yoshitaki. I'm a public health registrar, SD5, um, and um, it's my final placement um, of the training program in local authority. Um, just going to give you a quick kind of overview of how this came about. So obviously last year we experienced quite severe heat waves and um, you know there were lots of impacts not just for the health but also for the systems as a whole. So some schools and um, Alia setting closed. Um, one of the council offices had to be closed. So that obviously impacted on the vulnerable residents accessing the services that they needed to access, for example. And locally, we the healthcare settings also struggled to cope with the increased demand as well. Um, so with, with this context, um, uh, there was um, in Haringey, Climate Change and Public Health Task and Finish Group was set up in December last year. And heat wave was identified as one of the priority areas. So the project that I'm working on is a joint project between public health, carbon management department and emergency planning. And it's really to try and improve the preparedness for the heat waves for this year, heat wave this year. And as part of that sort of stakeholder engagement is the main methods that we're doing and rapid evidence review. And also working closely with um, national um, organization, government organization like UKHSA, GLA and national level meetings and events and getting lots of feedbacks and supports from them as well. Um, and just to share some key findings, um, so general consensus from the frontline services that they responded well, they would have benefited from greater and more tailored preparation. So as a result of that, um, we are working through the action plans that sort of been agreed to develop a bit more um, uh, uh, practical support and support for services and um, also sort of planning the activities throughout the year. Although this is in the guideline, this has not necessarily been implemented. So we are trying to implement that kind of thinking about heat waves and resilience throughout the year as well. Just a quick reflection so far, because this project is still ongoing, so I can't really talk about how it ended or complete learnings, etc. cetera. Um, but so far, my challenges has been sort of wide ranging stakeholders with different perspectives um, and no specific funding available for the, for the heat waves itself. So um, I had to be, I'm having to be sort of creative and it, there's lots of influencing and negotiation going on. So in terms of competencies and experiences like Mark experience, I think it gives a really good exposure to system leadership type role. What I'm finding is that when I speak to different services of um, you know, what's defined as vulnerable population groups, so social care, health, um, children and young people, they are all very keen and passionate about doing something. And actually, they're doing lots of things within their um, system. But obviously, it's in silo. So my role really, I feel like my role has been to identify those pockets of things that's happening, trying to sort of connect the dots together to, to un, you know, to, to really try to understand how the system works and improve that kind of system working relationship. So lots of sort of KA10 type um, competency that you can sort of cover. And the other thing that I would like to mention is that the climate change project, I think it's quite easily it can be quite easily be molded to address your specific interest and needs. So for example, with um, the other project that I'm working on is around air pollution, but um, I have uh, some interest in kind of healthcare, public health area. So I can really kind of focus on that area within the air quality to improve sort of air quality in care, care or health settings. Um, with the heat waves as well, you can sort of try to, if you're trying to address one of the specific learning outcomes, it's 
so easy to sort of try to embed that within your um, work project as well. So, um, so I think, um, you know, this is a, a quite an, I would say quite an ideal project, a type of project for especially kind of latter stages of um, training, because, you know, it really helps to get exposures to um, influencing negotiation, that sort of um, skill sets, as well as addressing some specific um, projects, uh, sorry, uh, learning objectives as well. I just wanted to mention one last thing, um, which was what was helpful for me to try to progress this project. So there was an established positive relationships between public health and carbon management team within, within the council that I'm working at. And that really helped because there was already a sort of um, a will, a political will to try and do something about it. And I think you know, without that, you would probably spending lots of time trying to influence on that subject. So I think, uh, you know, for ESs, and if you're thinking about trying to offer those um, projects as well, kind of establishing that relationships within the council would really, really help Registrar to really um, kick the ground and start on the project and get lots of experiences um, along the line as well. So it's very brief presentation and um, I'm happy to take any questions later on um, when the, the discussion's happening. Yeah, thanks Miho and please yeah, do stay on. I'm sure there'll be questions. Great, great local uh, project there and uh, so thanks very much. I'm gonna, without further ado, go on to uh, Laura Keast. Uh, Laura, if you could introduce your work from the, uh, who's a, from the Leadership and Management uh, NHS e, uh, Education Northeast. Over to you, Laura. Thank you, Paul. Um, I'll just really quickly share my screen. Um, and I've started my timer, so I will try and make sure I stick to five. Um, fab. Hopefully that's working now. Um, yeah, so thank you so much. Um, so my name's Laura. I'm a public health registrar in the Northeast region. I'm currently out of programme um, working at NHS e-education as well as Health Education England. Um, so this is um, just a, a quick talk about something quite kind of basic and low level that I did um, in my ST3 year compared to some of the stuff that we've heard so far. Um, so what I did was I actually established a local authority climate action group and this was whilst I was um, working at Stockton on Tees Borough Council in the northeast region so on my local authority placement. Um, basically, I um, went to a team meeting and took along the um, toolkit that had been developed by, I know some registrars are on the call today, um, and asked, kind of just tried to get the conversation going. And I think similar to Anya was saying, I think there was so much interest in the public health team um, at Stockton about this issue. However, kind of, you know, in COVID and post-COVID and everything, it just it had kind of slipped down the agenda naturally, given everything that was going on. Um, so what we realised was that actually there was scope to set up a little, um, just a little working group um, that then became called the Climate Action Group. Um, what we did was it was me and quite a few kind of the public health practitioners in the teams so It tended to be the kind of more junior members of the team that wanted to join or had the capacity to at that point. Um, we um, kind of had monthly meetings, tried to decide what we wanted to do. And our kind of main thing was just to try and start getting it on the forefront of people's minds. Um, we did things like we asked everyone to do the WWF carbon footprint calculator just to kind of raise awareness of what they were kind of doing day to day and have a think about it. And um, I shared that toolkit that was developed and that's absolutely brilliant. And um, we got involved with some local tree planting when it helped the, um, some areas of the council do that. Um, and we ran a CPD session for the public health team as well. And we actually made a really strong link with um, one of the more senior members of the council who was leading on the environmental sustainability strategy for the council. And that's a really strong relationship that was then built between the public health team and his team. Um, so we got him along to our meetings as well. And he was really helpful and brilliant. Um, so in terms of kind of what did it do and the legacy of it, um, it was a small kind of relatively informal group. But I think what it really did do is just bring climate change to the forefront of very busy people's minds um, so that people could start to think about actually where could we embed this into, into the work and the work we're doing as a, a team. It built these good relationships across the local authority and that was something that was kind of really lauded by our, our director of public health and they were very grateful for that kind of relationship building that had happened. Um, what we did was we really focused on um, kind of positive messaging as much as we could. We had a real awareness. And I think 
the, the majority of the team are probably the generation below me, um, so younger than me, and are very aware of um, the kind of climate anxiety that can be driven from this conversation. And they were so um, kind of up to date on, on the best ways of approaching that. So I kind of took their guidance on how to best get the messaging across. Um, so yes, we really tried to focus on positive actions that were happening educating the team um, and trying to kind of empower the team rather than rather than worrying everyone um because I think everyone's worried enough about it aren't they um in terms of since I've left the work has continued so somebody else took over chairing the group um I'm not sure exactly what they've been doing this year I'll have to have a catch up with her um but I know that um yeah it just it generated interest in the team it generated discussion um and I hope that it was just the kind of starting point of climate change um coming into kind of all the different areas of work that the team was doing um so I've managed to go really quickly through that so hopefully gained a bit of time back um but really happy to kind of take any questions afterwards um and always really happy to um be in touch with everybody as well um and I hope that's a kind of just helpful kind of simple quite low level example that um that I did in my ST3 year so thank you so much for your time yeah no, thanks very much Laura perfect spot on it is just the simple things that will often make a difference so uh really really good presentation the toolkit um I know people have asked uh can they see that we're going to our cat's going to um quickly do a presentation with Alyssa after when I hand over to her shortly so we'll share the toolkit shortly um without further ado though can I move on to uh Dimitri Nepagodis uh, uh who's going to take us through some work He's a clinical lecturer uh, at NIHR. Over to you, uh, Dimitri. I'm not sure. Do we have Dimitri on the call? Maybe not. Yeah, can you confirm if he's there? If not, let's move on then. Sharon, are you able to do a presentation now? Sharon Kennedy, who's a public health registrar in Yorkshire and Humber. Hi, it's Shannon. Hi. Hi, Sharon. Yeah, over to you and then we'll see if Dimitri can join at the end. Thank you. Sure. Are we sharing screens to share the slides? Sure. You can share your screen, Shannon. <laughs> Can I? We'll see if I can figure it out. Um, let's see if that. Oh, I'm not sure it's going to let me. Uh, hold on a sec. I will do it for you. No worries. No, that's why I said yeah. It's. I think I can. It's just a bit of faffing about in the system preferences, and that will make me have to quit Zoom, so I'll lose you all. So if you can, uh, Kat, that would be helpful. Great, thank you. Uh, yep, so um, hopefully I'm on brief today. I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about sort of what I've done around the climate and health uh, aspects of my activities in the scheme so far. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. So I've done a bit in ST2 and ST3. Um, in ST2, a lot of what I did was working with colleagues. So through being becoming part of the Public Health Declares Climate Action Group, and in that group, we looked at developing sort of a toolkit for star directions, because we got the sense that people, like colleagues working in local authorities, even where there was a lot of willing, there wasn't a lot of clarity about how to act on that in ways that were not huge and systemic, but maybe more bite-sized or kind of initial actions. So the toolkit was based on pulling together things other registrars had done as examples that could be shared out. And that was well received, certainly in the council I was placed in at the time. I also joined the Sustainable Development SIG um, and collaborated with other members within the SIG to, oops, sorry, could you go back? <laughs> to, uh, yeah, and that involved the response to the faculty's climate and health strategy. And we also, uh, in my own deanery, worked with a colleague to plan an adaptation and mitigation session, inviting external speakers. And then this past year, I've been on placement in the West Yorkshire ICB. It has a climate team. And so I, I specifically came to be in that team. And in the placement, I've uh, developed a new climate strategy for the ICS that's gone to the partnership board and um, worked on kind of developing the work around adaptation. Originally, I've been planning to do the adaptation plan 
that the sort of greener NHS agenda requires, but actually realised that that needed quite a lot more thinking to make it a public health relevant piece. So that led to helping set up a sort of network for public health colleagues with uh, Imru, who's on the call as well today, looking at people who were also working on adaptation in ICBs or ICSs. And through all that, we've developed as into a sort of subgroup within the sustainable development group. And we're looking at sort of work streams that will help develop a really um, robust and systemic public health approach to adaptation. Next slide, please. Thanks. So in terms of challenges with placements around the climate and health piece, I think finding one is one of the challenges. It, climate can still be seen as a niche or as a sort of a, as an issue apart from the normal day to day public health work that we do. Um, I've also seen challenge around the scope. So in terms of how much capacity there actually is to implement some of these ideas and some of the knowledge and the concern and put that into practice. I think I've found it uh, and have seen it in others work challenges around kind of creating or implementing a convincing narrative because to try and give climate and um, the biodiversity crisis kind of primacy alongside things like cost of living. So like, yes, that's very important, but helping people, colleagues understand the difference in scale of the uh, urgency and the um, disruption that will come from that. And so that leads me on to this final piece about scale. I've found a lot of challenge around the appetite and the capacity for the work being uh, kind of commensurate with the demand of the climate emergency. And even though people will say, oh yes, it's the biggest health issue of our lifetime, it's been in the lens that we know all that, actually understanding how does that then break down into a project that a registrar can do in a placement and balance that with the need to, I think, feel like the work that you're doing is meaningful in terms of not just taking an outcome, but contributing to progress around the climate and biodiversity emergencies. Next slide, please. Thanks. So in terms of supervision, uh, what's been supportive that I've had is trust. So supervisors and senior colleagues believing in a registrar's ability, um, really thinking about the interest uh, that we might sort of run with things and be able to do work as described. I think there's a sense maybe that you're sort of an up and coming generation. So you're closer and better connected to the, the climate piece. And I think some some in the best supervision that's appreciated and welcomed. And that can often lead to being given, so in my experience, autonomy. So free to get on with things, to say, yeah, take this to the system and press the system to change and to think about new opportunities and identify those uh, for your own work and then be able to just crack on with those. But in terms of gaps, I think I found certainly in the IC, B in the ICS, a lot of lack of clarity around authority and governance about who would actually do this work, where it would sit, and certainly where the responsibility for making it happen beyond just warm words of, yes, this is important, would happen. And then that piece about parsing the problem, actually understanding what are the bits of it that we're going to work on from within this organization and how are we going to contribute to the wider system work that needs to happen. And then that leads to issues of scoping the specific, the projects that sit under the problems you're trying to solve. And I don't know that supervisors are already always clear themselves and that can then make it really hard as a registrar. Next slide, please. So oh, in terms of assets and deficits, I feel that there's a lot of open space around the topic. So there's really scope for someone who's got a passion or an ambition or is just lucky to stake out their kind of unique claim in terms of the work and, and sort of build a profile around that if that's what you want. I think there's a lot of uh, enthusiasm. So within the faculty, within uh, certainly the SIGs, but also other colleagues across public health. And I don't just mean people with public health in the job title. I mean, people who are working in the system that contributes to public health. Um, yeah, there's growing permission to act. We've got lots of statutes and policies now that are helping increase. There's not enough, but it's growing. The deficits, I think, are, again, like I said, around climate still being seen as this discrete thing. It's not woven through in the way that things like health inequalities are, and it needs to get to that point, I think. And that can make it maybe hard to meet the climate outcomes if you're not in a climate placement, which I think is one of the things we really need to change. So it's not really integrated into our work in the way that it should be. Um, but ultimately we should be able to address this learning outcome through almost any placement we do, as far as I'm concerned. And that would be helpful, I think, if people had better examples and practical steps of how to address climate and meet the learning outcome with fleshed out examples across every aspect of the curriculum. Like in my dream world, every aspect of the curriculum would have a climate piece as an example. Uh, I think that's my last slide. Can we just click forward? Thank you. Yes, it is. Yay. <laughs> Thanks, everybody.
Yeah, uh, thank you. That was a great summary, really, of the challenges. And um, I'm going to uh, ask David uh, to reflect on some of this at the end as well, because I think a lot of this is about how do we put more placements in place. Uh, but also, some of it's about just pressing ahead, not necessarily seeking permission, but maybe forgiveness, uh, but moving ahead where we can. So let's have that conversation at the end. But um, first of all, I'm going to hand over to Kat, and Kat's going to coordinate a wider conversation and questions from the presentations and also bring in uh, Alyssa and the latest on the toolkit. Kat, over to you. Hello. Um, thanks, everyone, for your um, presentations and your uh, contribution to the um, the discussion. I think there is a bit of a confusion about the, to the toolkit. There is one toolkit that has been developed for um, the um, the local authorities, and Anya kindly shared it in the chat. And then there is a toolkit that is under development. And uh, Alisa is coordinating that. Alisa is one of the registrars from, uh, I think, east of England. And she's in our SIG. And she's leading on this toolkit with Alice. And I think Alisa wants to give just a, a couple of minutes to... Um, to introduce the idea behind the toolkit and how everyone can contribute to it. Alisa, if you are there, can you please? Hi, Kat, thanks. Um, yeah. I'll just see if I can, I've just got a couple of slides which might help to explain. Um, so I'll just see if I can share. Can you see this? Yes, yes, I can. Great. Yeah. So just a brief overview of this toolkit that we're putting together. And um, this is part of the Sustainable Development, uh, so Sustainable Development 6 2023 work plan. And the aim of this toolkit that we're putting together um, is that it will be a resource to support um, public health training for registrars to help um, increase public health registrar work around climate change and sustainability by providing registrars with a practical guide to aid this work. Um, and we did some um, background uh, surveying of registrars in um, our region, which is the east of England, and um, found that, um, as we've heard, registrars um, felt underconfident um, working in this area, um, uh, uncertain of appropriate sustainability measures to use, and um, felt that their supervisors were also quite uncertain um, in this area, um, and that uh, toolkit would, would help. So this is why we've embarked upon this. Um, in terms of the structure of the toolkit, um, it's broadly got two parts. There'll be a directory um, signposting people to information regarding climate change um, and health impacts and major agencies involved in this work. Um, I'd just like to focus on the second section mainly here, which is the um, which will be uh, categorized by by core placement type within public health training. So um, we've divided it into um, five core placement types that um, many registrars will go through within their training in the UK. Um, so that's local authority, health protection, healthcare, public health, screening and IMS, and academic placement, and then a sort of other category as well for um, placements, including national treasure placements. Um, and for each of those, um, we're going to have various different types of information. So um, information, linking uh, common projects undertaken in those placements with climate change and sustainability in different ways um, and um, information linking um, uh, common topics that arise within those placement types, for example, inequalities, commercial determinants of health and how they can be linked with climate change and sustainability. And then lastly, um, activities that registrars might be able to get involved in to promote greater sustainability in that placement type. Um, for example, supporting ongoing work um, and ongoing structures within that placement type related to climate change and sustainability um, or uh, convening a sustainability group, those sorts of things. So we're currently undertaking a, um, a data collection exercise to inform this toolkit. Um, and we're going through various routes to do this. Um, we're basically trying to find people who as registrars have um, completed projects, big and small, that have included climate change measures or sustainability measures in 
anyway. Um, so it could be um, things, projects that um, uh, were um, driven by climate change or sustainability and health as, as their focus, or um, that just uh, one of the outcomes was climate change or sustainability related. Um, and it includes um, projects like um, projects themselves, like health needs assessments, et cetera, that are commonly done within public health training, but also um, more activity or advocacy um, based um, things that registrars might have done. Um, we've heard some of those today. Um, so um, we've devised a standardized online template um, to capture these these pieces of work and um, I'll put the link in the in the chat but we'd be really grateful um, for anybody who um, is on this call who has done any sort of climate change or sustainability um, related project or has incorporated these things within any of their public health work to um, to, to uh, submit this in a, in this template form um, and then we can capture this within within the toolkit to show um, registrars what they might be able to do in each different placement type that they come across. Um, we can also, we're arranging interviews with um, key public health in, um, informants within each, um, experts within each placement type um, to get more in-depth information about what registrars can be doing within those placement types. Um, and um, if you um, know of a key contact that we might be able to interview about a particular placement type, that would be great. Um, and we're also happy to talk through the template and fill it in on a call rather than having someone do it themselves if, if that's what you would prefer or if you have multiple projects and you prefer to just talk it through and have um, one of the people in the working in the toolkit working group fill it in for you, we can also do that. So I'll put the template um, in the chat and also my email, which is here. Um, and um, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alisa. So um, we'll share some of um, the slides that the presenters gave to us. And uh, Alisa, if you are happy, we'll also share yours and your contact so that registrars can get in touch with you to contribute to the, um, to the toolkit. Thank, Thank you sure. very much. And uh, Dimitri has now joined. So uh, we'll just give him five minutes to present the, his project and then we'll um, start the, the, the discussion. Dimitri, if uh, you yeah. there. Uh, sorry, th thank you very much, Kat. I'm sorry I'm, I'm late, I just got held up. Um, so I, I didn't prepare any slides. I, I, I sort of expect to talk just for a couple of minutes, which is to say that I'm a lecturer here at the University of Birmingham. And uh, coming out of COVID, one of the sort of research areas we've been looking at is um, the elective recovery. How do we get back to normal levels of operating in the NHS? But one of the other issues that came out of that is um, as we scale up our surgery, our surgical volume in the country, what's the environmental impact of that? Um, so we know that the NHS has committed to a net zero health system by 2040. And that's important because the NHS accounts for up to 5% of carbon emissions. And operating theatres are the most carbon intensive part of a hospital. So we probably think about 25% of a hospital's carbon output. So you can probably work that out that operating theatres are about 1% nationally. So we have decided, uh, we, we've designed a research program um, to try to evaluate and implement uh, strategies to uh, mitigate the environmental impact of surgery. Um, so there's work streams around uh, anesthesia, how we can reduce the use of harmful anesthetic gases with high global warming potential. Um, how can we increase reusable um, uh, sort of equipment in theater. So we're setting up a trial comparing reusable versus single use uh, gowns and drapes. And how can we improve waste management so that we're not sending as much stuff for incineration, we can reduce our waste, we can uh, increase our recycling rates. So that's the work we're doing. Um, so for me, um, the involvement has been around designing the research questions so how can we design robust 
research to evaluate the environmental imp uh, the impact of these environmental interventions and um so so that's sort of a competence competency for me but i would sort of foresee that in the future there would be opportunities for other registrars to come in and sort of participate in in running some of these studies and and then there might be sort of um competencies in that as well i guess so that's a bit more university research based, but but I just thought I'd share that. Thank you very much, Dimitri. So um, we are now at the point where we will really welcome everyone in this um, workshop to ask questions, come up with ideas, and basically brainstorm with us how we can overcome the many challenges that are experienced by registrars when they try to engage with um, climate and health or environment and health sustainability related placements. So one of the key aspects here that has been mentioned by several people is the issue of having either placements or projects. And that was something that Mark mentioned already in the beginning and then Anya also highlighted how she had to work for the environmental agency whilst based in a local authority and that's great that she was able to do it but that's not possible across all the regions and that's something that is preventing registrars in some parts of the country to access placements that they would they could or projects or to get the competencies they would, would like to get because of these regional inequalities. So I don't know if there are any registrars who want to comment on it or any educational supervisors in the meeting who, who want to um, to feedback on their experience, particularly educational supervisors, what it is like to supervise registrars when they are doing projects elsewhere in an in another organization whether this is something that then can be shared with the the regions that are not allowing it to be done at the moment any volunteers David, if you are still there, yep. would you mind just um, giving the FPH position <laughs> on this? Okay, uh, I mean, uh, this is something I was going to pick up at the end anyway, uh, in terms of, as you say, this this issue about projects and placement. So, um, the um, I mean, just to say, I mean, the, all those um, projects we've seen uh, have been very impressive and, and uh, you know, not just the effort people got put in to sort of get things going and what they got out of it and, and, and some legacy as well. And I think, you know, this session will help shift things forward. So um, I think since COVID, I'm very much pushing that um, the, the agenda that we should be doing more project work because it avoids the enormous bureaucracy around placements there clearly is a need for some key placements and and um, you know some of them we mentioned like in uh, the uk health security agency but actually you know it's very clear from um, what people are doing that quite it, it, quite often you're placed in an organization that is interested in in climate and health or at least you can um uh, you know make sure they are um you know all local authorities have some interest clearly it's varies around the country perhaps sometimes with political complexion as to how much effort but but you know that there are always opportunities in local authorities um and and equivalent um in scotland wales and northern ireland so um you know we do, um, just just a note for the for the toolkit you, you know local authorities are, are where you are in england but make sure it's you, you think about all the all the nations and their different ways they're set up um uh, in terms of I, I think you're right there is variation in the way that the regions allow um a, a sort of uh 
the people to do projects slightly outside their own placements um and and i think but i think it, as i say the placement system doesn't doesn't fit very well with, with public health it, it, it's you know it's, it's a gmc system that's based around having you know surgical trainees in a safe unit and and because of the way we operate particularly now doing so much work remotely um it, it doesn't it doesn't sort uh, sort of work very well for us so so i think that's why we need to have our own um flexibility as long as people are are safe um it's worth noting that in most specialties the educational supervisor does not work with you day to day you know that, that is they supervise your education um often from another organization uh and, and see you over uh, you know, over a different periods of time, and, and but but you have a clinical supervisor who who oversees your day to day work. We we combine those roles, but but there's no reason why we shouldn't separate them. And educational supervisors, um, how, you know, manage someone who's who's you know, primarily been supervised in in um, another part of the organisation. Um, you know, in local authorities that you could be in housing or um, in in. Uh, in environment or other bits or or, or in a different organization like the environment agency I, I, so, so i think there's some work for me to do with the heads of schools and tpds just to, to kind of encourage that flexibility and i think sessions like this are really helpful in terms of just showing how it can work safely in different places um it's always very hard for me to comment on individual cases because there may be specific reasons why a tpd says you know you've got to focus on these particular learning outcomes and this isn't a suitable placement or you know there may have been issues with um supervision uh, in a particular place so so you know i can't comment individually but i do i do recognize your comment cat that that you know some regions seem to be much more adept at at, at uh, giving people opportunities um and I, I think the other reason you know for thinking about both projects within your own organization and, and more widely is that the point made about you know, this needs to be woven through training. Um, uh, if if someone, uh, I agree, if someone can come up with a, you know, with with us, you know, examples for every single learning outcome, please do. It, you know, we that's often the way to encourage people, uh, and that's the risk of of a sort of uh, a, a separate placement where it becomes, you know, a niche that some people do and most people don't. Um, it, it should be something that you know everyone throughout their training should get some opportunity within um, wherever they're working to do some work around climate and health. And I think uh, at the, the talk, it's going to be very helpful because, you know, some, some people are more confident, some people have done work on this even before they came into training and, it, and they're confident and others, um, it's all a bit new and, and a bit of support in terms of how they tackle um things and and uh, it, it's perfectly reasonable for you to you know manage up to get your educational supervisor to think about it and as i said at the beginning you know and and train your trainer in in things that you're learning uh, that, that they may, maybe haven't because of the time they trained um so so uh, as i say i think i think we'll you know th these examples are going to help and i will um uh you know, have another discussion with the heads of school and TPDs, and I think it's a, a slightly broader than this topic. Uh, or this topic is a good example, but um, in terms of yeah, how, how how we manage people successfully in 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 a, in a time when actually a lot of things could be done remotely, so you don't have to go and place yourself in a, in another bit of the country to to learn stuff. Um, and and we'll you know we'll we'll, we'll work on that um, over the next uh, few months or so. Thank you very much. Anyone has any questions or uh, any further feedback? Yeah, is it worth just checking whether this sort of event is helpful? Um, as David says, we've, we've got um, some really good examples now which he can use in his conversations with heads of schools and thanks David I really welcome your your support in this um but uh we, is there any mileage in doing repeating something similar in the next few months because I think there is a lot of work out there that we're not really hearing about as well and is that something we should be testing That's a question for everyone. It is, yeah. Lynn, do you want to unmute yourself on okay. the? Sure, I'll 
try and turn my video as well to just sort of be easier to come in rather than trying to type in the chat so just yeah. so yeah I thought it was um really helpful to hear um different people's case studies um, can you hear me okay because I think my yes we can awesome. okay um yeah really helpful to hear examples um especially when you're the only registrar based in the placement it can be quite difficult sometimes to think of ideas and in, in terms of incorporating um you know climate related projects into existing pieces of work which I agree is probably you know the best way to make sure that this work is being integrated into the organizations and not just sitting within the more like specialist um, national bodies um, I did have a question though um, to follow up Anna's point um, and also um, uh, the first presentation so in terms of those um, organizations like the environment agency or uh, DEFRA, for example, um, is there already like a network of contacts um, of public health, you know, um, either consultants or people with an interest in public health to uh, within those organisations that we can tap into? Um, I'm just wondering if we were to, for example, try and arrange a regional placement with our local environment agency um, team, how we might go about doing that. Thank you. I don't know if uh, Emma is still around. I think she is, and if she is able to answer. For the regional placements, I think you'd have to reach out to the regional office of, for instance, the Environmental Agency and, um, and send an, an email to the general email inquiry, and the, hopefully they will forward it to the, to the right place, to the right person. Going forward, this is something that I think would be really useful for us in addition to the, or maybe as an appendix to the toolkit with the examples of placements would be to have um, something um, like a list of regions and links, emails, so that every people who want to do these things can uh, easily get in touch. Anya may have um, some further feedback. I was just going to directly answer the one about the environment agency and um, Lynn, I mean, basically to everybody, if anyone was interested in doing a project with the environment agency, then please do drop me an email and I'll link you directly up with their head of public health at the environment agency who will then be able to cascade it back down to the local office in the area where you're based. So um, he's definitely the entry point for them. Um, and they were in, they're also in conversation with UKHSA about kind of the shared idea of placements, but I don't know where that's got to yet either. Hi. Yeah, I think, <clears throat> I think that there's a diversity of opportunities out there and the best place to find out about them and to link yourself in is via the SIG. I know that Anya's put in the chat because the DEFRA thing, it would be a lot about, you know, where you are in your training and what's ac actually happening in DEFRA at the time so that you can talk through how you could approach that conversation because all of this is new so it's not like you know we could produce document but it's going to probably be out of date very quickly and these are the you know our our first beginnings of you know once it's established that these relationships exist it'll be much easier but for now I think it's best you know having personal introductions to the person to say actually there's some good ideas here they're aligned with your x y and z strategy or policy priorities at the moment and take it from there so yeah, just go to the SIG, I think is probably the conclusion. Thanks very much, Beth. Any further questions or comments or feedback? It'd be really okay. useful. I mean, I can just jump in on the back of that um, if anyone's got any other questions, but basically I've put a bit in the chat about how we have in the past provided people with support via the SIG as well and done kind of shared learning between people um, and people have come along and said, oh, I've just started a placement in X local authority. I have no idea where to start. This is the kind of current status quo. And also you've got a group of people there who've got various different types of experience. Also, it's not just registrars, registrars, consultants and academics kind of working in other roles in public health as well. And um, so you can get quite a lot of kind of good ideas generated quite quickly. So it's a good place to come along to if you just want to kind of say, come for some ideas. Um, and hopefully the toolkit will help with with disseminating kind of the more concrete ideas that also um, more widely.
and um, Rachel also put um, some feedback um, on the um, on the chat. Thank you very much. So unless every anyone else wants to comment or send any feedback, of course you can also do it after after the meeting. You have all our contacts on the on the web pages. Uh, otherwise, I'll thank everyone to to coming for coming today, and uh, we'll share the slides, share the contacts after the meeting with everyone who registered for the. The event and the recording will also be available on the um, FPH website soon, as soon as we have it edited and uh, cleaned. Anything and just else? Just to say, uh, yeah. Um, yep, yeah, go, go. No, I was just going to say before we call, uh, call off, just say a big thanks to you as well for coordinating this. and. Um, Huge thanks to David as well, who I know um, is very much on side with this and we'll keep pushing in the boundaries. And um, just to emphasize what Anya said also, the, the, a key way of pushing this is working through the SDC. So please join it if you're not involved. And um, uh, and thanks very much. I think, Kat, is there anything else you want to say before we go? No? No, I don't think so. Unless anyone has any last questions anything if not then thank you very much and uh, yep. hopefully i will see you at the conference in uh, three weeks time on the 21st we have our uh, conference on um, climate adaptation in the uk with an impressive lineup of uh, speakers so see you then if you have not registered there is still plenty of time Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Just to say thanks, thanks everyone. It's great presentations. Thank you. Thank you.